There's a contrived rule of life that I've just made up on the spot. All hoses that come off must be replaced, and these replacements put back on again. Concise and profound. You'll all have seen Alan's cooling circuit being drained and dismantled in the last episode. I put the new basic upper hoses on first, using single ear O clips for these smaller radiuses, not Jubilee clips. The first one I'm going to do is where it went via the preheater and then back into the engine again. It's a simple one. Okay, not quite first. As that handsome young man just imparted, I'm linking the two interfaces on the port side, where the water preheater once resided. It's still on eBay, by the way. I'm not optimistic. Through the interim, I taped over all the hose tails and inlets so nothing could end up inside, but then it's time for more rubber. I'm still 5% sure I could just block these hose tails, but 5% is less than 95%, so instead I'm making a neat connection with right angle connectors and more O-clips. There's nothing to brace a rigid copper pipe onto, so I'm sticking with hoses for now. On this engine, as far as I can deduce, no two hose tails or connections are the same gauge. How helpful. I'm now having to be diplomatic with hose diameters and clip sizes. Once expanded over a hose tail, the clampable diameter of course changes again. And then the Achilles heel of otherwise wonderful O-clips. The crimping pliers need space and a specific angle, and we didn't have space. I looked, but I couldn't find a special right angle tool. Anyhow, I did my best and hoped that this wouldn't cause my first leak. All the other clips went on pleasingly. I did consider using a single length of hose, running through plastic conduit elbows to guide the turns, but that would entail more hassle than it would have been worth. The stresses we go through to get water from one place to another place. This clip was half a millimetre too narrow, and so I needed to wait three days for a replacement to be delivered. Over to the other side of Alan's engine. There's a hose reducer heading out of the lower part of the block, and then coolant flows aft along a copper pipe. It's destined for the gearbox of all places. I don't like this copper pipe. It's floppy, gets in the way of the through hulls, and necessitated Alan's makers to gouge out some fiberglass. Unsatisfactory. Before taking on the copper itself, I've decided to mount a rubber damped Munson ring into the side of the engine bay as a sort of support. That rubber reducer needs all the help it can get in order to survive. Vibrations, you see. Okay, back to the copper. I didn't like it. So the grinder came out. Thing is, that wasn't enough. And the copper had its revenge. I needed to remove yet more and couldn't fit the grinder in and my Dremel was cowering at home. So out with the junior hacksaw and much swearing. It did finally relent. And I filed and smoothed the end so the copper didn't take yet more revenge on my new hoses. Right, enough for now. I'm installing valves just inside both of the keel cooler through hulls this means I can control flow, and if the keel cooler is damaged and letting in seawater, I can isolate it and then attach a backup over the side cooling loop. I did try first with L-port valves, but their architecture is a lot bulkier in a space-constrained zone, and these had a reduced flow design. Instead, my emergency changeover plan will necessitate a little hose cutting and reclipping, but I think that's a fair compromise. These stainless steel valves are full bore, so no getting in the way of my indomitable torrents of coolant. These hose tails were confoundingly expensive, but alas, too long at both ends. I'm looking for space saving at the hose end and, well, a complete parallel thread fit at the other. The solution? Loyal Allen Army viewers, you know already. The hose tails end up within a vise and are subjected to a length reduction. The hose end is fairly easy, as there's still a couple of barbs left to form a good watertight seal, but the screw end obviously needs to be cut carefully so as not to ruin the thread. My precision and artistry yet again humbly exposed, and working through dusk so as to get dramatic sparky grinder footage, the job was done. My expensive hose tails had grown smaller. I assembled the valves and hose tails, the idea being for the whole length to be as short as possible while still doing its job. My choice to make them together was belt and braces. The threads are parallel, not tapered, so do need washers. Tightly clamped copper in this case. I'm also running a ring of higher tight sealant around the thread. Although I can't easily do so, apparently this gunge improves its seal yet more if cured at high temperature for a few hours. 
Let's put the valves aside for a moment and get on with the other starboard side hose work. To start, a custom reducer I asked a magician on eBay to make for me. Space is limited in the area it's to be fitted into, so I've slid the hoses over the reducer overly far and then once in place, I can shuffle them outwards to extend the length and fit over the metal inlets and outlets. Hopefully you can see what I mean here. It requires a little pre-planning so that all the Jubilee clips, fine to use on these wider diameters, are in place before sliding one end onto the engine. I can then shuffle the hoses along to get as much overlap as possible and then do up all of the clips. You can see another hose hiding behind, and this again illustrated how inconsistent hose tail connections have caused headaches. I couldn't justify a reducer here, but even with heating, I couldn't get the hose as far over the lip as the old softer hose had managed. Still, there's just enough for the Jubilee clip to get a full grip over the metal beneath. I couldn't use an O-clip as I couldn't get access with the O-clip tool. I'm quite glad that I'm working inside today because outside it is a blustery... Ugh. Unhappy day. Back inside again, I think. Next, I'm tackling the join between the thermostat housing and one of the through holes, with another major reduction in hose diameter. With the valves completed, I was about to go and install them, but then I realised that some of the angles are extremely tight down there, and so I'm having to do another couple of dog legs to get the hose to go in the right direction. This isn't ideal, as every time there's a join, there's a potential for failure or leaks but it's better than forcing the hose into a tight bend or having two hoses clashing. This involves lots and lots of cutting, checking, rechecking, and then finally tightening all the clips. And for the first time in a few months after a truce, Alan has drawn blood. Anyhow, I can prepare the through hole with a good brush, cleaning with a light solvent and pre-positioning the Jubilees. And these hoses will fit tightly, so. Well, I'm not a coffee or a tea drinker, but what I have done is invested in a collapsible silicon kettle, which I've now switched on. And that's going to give me some hot water so I can heat up the hoses and get them onto the tighter fittings. Alan's going to have limited space for a galley, and whilst AC power will be possible, it's not my chosen main system, so space saving with my collapsible kettle is welcome. And it actually works, unlike those silly low voltage DC camping kettles. I've gone for a direct method of heat softening the hoses and soon ended up with a nicely secure reduction. The custom made stainless reducer could have been shortened, but I checked and the space available could handle it uncut. So a proper tightening up once again, and then this fairly complex succession of reducer, elbows and valve can be installed into the engine bay. All the careful measurements, checking and rechecking, and the time taken to customize the path proved worth it. And now that you can see that the area is becoming busier and busier with hoses, I'm double checking the accessibility to all the screws on the Jubilee clips. My aim is, when everything is installed, to be able to get a screwdriver or O-clip pliers to each and every fitting. This means I can tighten on the go if there's a slow leak, or even swap out without having to rip everything else out too. Those full bore valves are looking rather smart too and I've been pre-positioning some Kevlar fabric pads for areas where chafing or glancing contact is unavoidable. Now for the big loop between the other side of the gearbox and the second through hull. Again, I pondered other ways of achieving this very precise shape without cuts and joins, but settled on a simple but time-consuming solution. It fits in as planned and doesn't bash into any of the plethora of pipes and lines at this busy end of the engine. You can see that there's a slight flex, and although I may install a bracket into the side of the engine bay to support the valves, I like this. I could have made rigid screw fits between, for example, the through holes and the valves, but firstly, those old threads are pretty tired and I'm not sure of their specification. And so frankly, I just see them as hose tails as Alan's makers did from the start. Second, if a major impact hits the valves, the force could damage the through hole if they were firmly screwed together. Valves can be replaced on the fly, but through holes cannot. The blue handles have been shortened and I've checked that they can operate fully and freely while still being long enough to be easily rotated. A quick connection to the unbarbed tube on the port side of the gearbox and we're done. The newly lagged exhaust has been off throughout all of this, otherwise I'd have lacked space to work, but that's the next task. The end pokes neatly through the exhaust port, 
but I do need to drill, seal and bolt it in at some point. The business end of the exhaust pipe now needs to have its final connection to the turbocharger's exhaust flange made. This is one hell of a fiddly job, even though it looks simple at first glance. Four threaded studs, four holes through the two flanges and the gasket, and eight locking all-metal aerotight nuts. But the access around the back was interrupted by the turbo for most of my sockets and spanners. Plus, you can't get the first nut on without using two normal lock nuts on the other end in order to get something fixed for the aerotite to spin onto. Then, I needed to make sure that the copper grease was evenly distributed where it needed to be. Finally, when doing the final tightening, it was something of a lottery as to which aerotite was going to lock and which was going to tighten, meaning it was a game of trying to have the stud in the middle not sticking out one end whilst not fully running through the locking mechanism at the other. Anyhow, I did it. Two final bolts. These are the two from the keel cooler down below. The plugs came out looking a little bit mucky and with remnants of the original PTFE tape hanging off in tatters. But given that they've now been exposed to the elements or underwater for over a decade, not so bad. Definitely fine for a clean up and refitting. You've been lucky enough to see me brush bolts to a state of cleanliness before, so here they are, ready. I'm no more a plumber than I am a sailor, but I'm sure that I can do the taping and the final seal to a good standard. You go clockwise with a Teflon tape so it doesn't unwind when you screw the bolt in, and it was going to be guesswork as to how many turns. Too few, and it won't work, but too many, and you may clog the thread, so jamming the whole thing up. I had a couple of false starts, but eventually got it right. The seal is all inside the thread, so I decided not to damage the protective weathered cupro nickel on the outside by sanding or brushing too hard. But a quick tidy up seems sensible, in case any detritus got into the threads. There's a question mark about how many little bits of flaked paint or Paris Teflon tape are trapped within the cooling system, but since there were no circulation issues before, I'm just being careful and trying not to introduce anything new. I could finger turn the bolts roughly halfway, with some resistance that told me that the tape was creating a seal, and then the rest needed my mini ratchet socket, the one that has got me out of a number of clearance conundrums recently. It was an impulse purchase from the famously idiosyncratic central aisle of a budget supermarket, some of you may know. I added a little circle of hylotite sealant once again for a belt and braces seal. The old sealant between the cooler and the hull can be scraped off and resealed when I make the keel cooler's protective shield this winter. Back inside, Adam felt ready to show he was unleashed from this complex multi-week job, but first I did a once over. This would not be the time to realise that I'd missed an entire outlet or forgotten a clip. I hadn't, but I did go around each and every clip once again to retighten. After a few days, it seems the rubber in the hoses beds in and can then take a little more tightening, but I'm still only going to the point of hand tight with a screwdriver. I have had a good look inside the header tank and there were a couple of little flakes of paint which I've managed to scoop out. But apart from that, I'm gonna to have to trust that there's not more gunk or uh, obstruction stuck in the system. There were no particular problems when I was running the engine before, so I've got no reason to expect a big problem now. Uh, but yes, it's uh, a bit annoying that I can't do like a really, really good flush through. Anyway, time for new coolant. I've researched various coolants, and I'm not going for a waterless coolant. Besides the cost and the fact that it's not easy to find in random shops around the world in case I need to top up, the main issue is that you need to completely empty the circuit of residual water first, and I can't do that. Instead, I'm going for a good quality coolant in concentrated form, and then choosing a one-to-one -one ratio mix with deionized water. It's the richest ratio the coolant company recommends to get the best cold performance, but still allowing sufficient heat transfer. And yes, I could have pre-mixed it in a large container and stirred first, but I have it on good authority this technique of alternating from each bottle works just fine. Just in case I've gone a bit overboard with the coolant, I'm going to stick a bucket down here in the bilge. This is the moment of truth. Are there going to be any leaks? And yes, I am casually placing a gap between the exposed, soon to be rather warm turbocharger and the plastic bucket. And that new extra long straight through silencer produces a nice rumbly note out of the back, 
rather like an enormous V8 detuned for a long, relaxing cruise. Or maybe not. This bit might need a support, but it's fine for now. Anyhow, I'll let you inspect it all, as I did, without me rabbiting on. I called that a success. No leaking, I can't smell exhaust fumes in here. Uh, nothing appears to have exploded or gone inside out, so I'm pretty happy with that. I have noticed one tiny oil leak. I've checked that it is on square, so maybe the two bolts simply need a retighten now that the fabric gasket is saturated. With that, the task is complete. I showed you this last time round. I want a way to easily check that my freshwater cooling circuit hasn't been compromised whilst underway. To do this, I need to test for salt in the coolant. This machine apparently costs many thousands of pounds, so Alan will have to do without. But I may invest in some basic salinity test strips, so every now and again I can dip it into the header tank's reservoir and see if any C has found its way in and so signal a problem with the keel cooler's health and happiness. You'll recall that I was underwhelmed with my first efforts at removable blackout blinds for the windows, so I sent for this enormous thing. Lots of packaging for a product that's less than a millimetre thick. It's oddly vastly cheaper in large sheet form than if supplied pre-cut. This is Lexan polycarbonate, the same sort of hyper-tough and quote-unquote virtually unbreakable plastic I've used in thicker sheets for the secondary glazing. I've expanded my ambitions since last time. This time, I'm going to cut two pieces for each window, with a grinder, naturally. You've got to be brisk, otherwise the friction melts the plastic and spoils the edge. One of each pair will be kept clear and can be used for temporary triple glazing and so extra insulation. The other I'll coat for blacking out Alan's interior. Since each will be so thin, storing them will be easy, altogether barely thicker than a magazine or two. And the adhesive magnetic strips are going on a different way this time, hopefully to avoid the stretch and bagginess issues from when I tried the blackout fabric. I'm putting the B side of the magnet strips onto the A sides first. The A sides are strongly adhered to the foil insulation. Then, off comes the backing film. If I'm very careful and make sure everything is lined up and square before committing and pressing the polycarbonate onto the strips, I should get a perfect result. And I do. Well done me. I can go round and neaten up the edges with a file and find sandpaper later. Then naturally, high on success and magnetic brilliance, I'm brought firmly back to earth. For the blackout one, shall I go for foil tape or a plastic paint? But now, why am I showing you this anode again? Surely we sorted that out in the last episode. Well, I did think I was light on the ground footage-wise back when I was editing the last one, and this is why. These clips ended up misfiled in the wrong folder, and now I will inflict them on you. This is a dirty anode. This is a clean anode. This is me talking about madness and chipping brass. I think it would be madness to change this over now, so I'll keep the other anode as a spare and this can go straight back in. All I have done is uh, basically taken the paint off and when I was using the wrong size spanner I managed to jink a little bit off the edge of the brass, but apart from that there's no point changing that over. Back in the engine. And this is a freshly painted over anode bolt as if nothing had ever happened. Super. Bye.